my angels, it's Haley Reese and welcome to or welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am so grateful that you are here and I hope that you are having an absolutely fantastic morning, afternoon or night, whatever it is for you when this video finally reaches you. Wow, long time no see guys. I feel like it's been so long since I've sat down here and filmed a video at length with you and oh boy, I have seriously missed you guys so much, but thank you for that time, that space and that grace. I feel like I am becoming the best version of myself right now and I'm so excited to share that version with you guys and to be back here with my content and in the world of the internet. Today's case is one that I've been wanting to dive into and cover for so long now. This was one of those cases that took the world by a storm that shocked absolutely everybody and was nationwide news. Almost everybody was talking about this case. We are diving into the case of Gabby Petito, her relationship with Brian Laundrie that would seem perfect to those on the outside, but turn murderous in reality. Now this case is deemed solved. So many of us have heard all of the different theories and conspiracies that have followed this case, but today we are going to dive into everything from the disappearance to the murder of Gabby Petito, to the relationship of Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie, to our understanding from what we've learned up until this point. And just all of the shocking turns within this case up until the discovery of what is said to have happened, though I truly believe, at least for me, it left me with more questions than answers. Young love, adventure, a seemingly perfect online relationship. Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie seemingly had it all. Um, in the eyes of their family, their friends, and their followers online, the adventurous couple was deeply in love and ready to take on the world with one another by each other's side. But as we all know, unfortunately, what was once the trip of a lifetime would turn disappearance and murder case. And in the end, as I mentioned, leave us with so many more questions than answers. So let's get into the Gabby Petito story. Quick disclaimer before we get into today's video, I do want to note that there are some heavy subjects within this case regarding and surrounding domestic violence. So with that being said, I would just really appreciate if you would bear that in mind prior to continuing on with this video, if that is something that is a sensitive subject for you. And I do want to take a moment before continuing to note that I will have links and resources at the very top of my description. If you or somebody that you love is in a type of situation, relationship, or anything of the sorts where you feel stuck or you feel trapped or need help of any sorts, please, please, please reach out to one of the linked resources or a resource near you. I promise you there is help and there is light. But with all of that being said, let's get into the Gabby Petito story. I love the van. And I'd like to report a domestic dispute. Florida license plate, white land. Uh, we drove by and the gentleman was slapping the girl. He was slapping her? Gabby Petito never goes outside. It's because too many times women who are at risk want to go back to their abuser. They just wanted him to stop and they don't want to have to be separated. They don't want him charged. They don't want him to go to jail. And then they end up getting worse and worse uh, treatment and then they end up getting killed. But then again, I don't have a crystal ball. Tonight, there are some new twists and turns in the case of a woman from Long Island who disappeared while on a road trip. Her boyfriend returned to Northport without her. Where is Gabby? Where is Gabby? They've been trying to talk to Brian for days to get information they believe could be critical to finding Gabby. But now that he has disappeared, they don't have that opportunity. 
The body found in Grand Teton National Park is Gabby Petito. Her death now ruled a homicide. For Brian, we're asking you to turn yourself in. Earlier today, investigators found what appears to be human remains, along with personal items, such as a backpack and notebook belonging to Brian Laundrie. Brian Laundrie is dead. It means a lot to me that she's touched so many lives already. We're going to keep it going, like you said, keep the light going and help a lot of people if we can. So Gabrielle Petito was born March 19, 1999 in Blue Point, Long Island, New York. Gabby's family described her as beautiful, artistic, creative, kind, loving. She was described as having this smile that could light up any room that she went into. And I mean, come on, by looking at photos and videos of Gabby, it is so apparent how much her energy just radiates from her. And that was really what her family wanted to emphasize about Gabby was that she was this beautiful, incredible light. And we'll get more into that a little bit later in today's video. But she was just described as adventurous, genuine, and beyond that, Gabby was loved so very much by her family. Now, it is said that growing up, Gabby was always smiling. She had what her family described as the most infectious laugh, one of those laughs that are so distinguishable as to who it's coming from. And she was just described as this very busy, happy little girl who had lots of friends and she loved school, especially art. Gabby absolutely loved art and creativity and that shows even into her adult life. You know, she just loved the outdoors. Gabby was really, really close with her family. And again, like anything online or on TV, we're only seeing what we're shown. But from what transpired from the moment of Gabby's disappearance publicly to everything that would later follow, they really radiate this unconditional love amongst them. And I think that that's incredible. Gabby was actually one when her stepmom and her had met for the first time. And she was three when her stepfather and her had met for the first time. And despite her parents being separated, she was loved just as much from what we can see by her parents and her stepparents all collectively together. In fact, even in interviews at points when I was digging through this case, it's hard to tell unless you know who her biological parents parents are and who her step parents are because there's just this like unison of love. It's really beautiful. So in high school, Gabby would meet Brian Laundrie and the two didn't actually date in high school. They knew of each other. They knew that they had similar interests and they did have things in common, but they didn't link up until after high school. With that said though, both of them were incredibly adventurous. They loved all things outdoors and they would realize that there really was something more between them. I believe it was around 2019 when the two of them would begin to date. Now, this would begin the start of so many adventures that the two of them would have together. On paper, it really seemed like the perfect relationship. And that goes without saying that we all can perceive things how others want them to be shown online. But that really was the case with these two. And when we talk in terms of perfect couple or a couple that was perceived as perfect, we're talking about this videography online vision of Brian and Gabby that were shared with us and via all forms of social media. Those close to Gabby had quite a different perspective on Brian. Some people had claimed that Brian was temperamental, hot-headed, while others said the two argued like normal. But Gabby Petito's best friend says Brian Laundrie had jealousy issues. Even telling people that she remembered expressing concerns to her mother after first meeting Brian, 
telling her at the time that he's a little weird, saying something was off about him, but she didn't know what. She proceeded to say that Brian Laundrie is a sociopath and a liar and that Gabby would often talk about their blow up arguments and the fights that they would have. He was also said to be controlling with Gabby's friend claiming that he didn't even like it when Gabby would work. So those close to them had a very different perspective. It wasn't this perfect couple. But nobody imagined it could ever, ever, ever be this dark. So let's talk about Brian. Who exactly is Brian Laundrie? Well, Brian Laundrie was born November 18th, 1997. Gabby's parents would describe him as polite and quiet. And they felt as though he was someone that their daughter would be incredibly safe in the hands of, which I think is haunting given what we know now. It's incredibly haunting that that was the way that they would have described Brian prior to what would happen to their daughter as this polite, kind, safe space for her. Brian had a real love for the outdoors, much like Gabby. He was a little more extreme from what I've gathered though. He was an environmentalist and a minimalist. He was really keen on living a minimalistic, environmentally friendly lifestyle and was really an advocate for the environment, climate, all of the above. So he was ecstatic about Gabby's vision in adventuring because all he really wanted was to protect and see the world as well at this given point in time. So again, from the outside at this point, it's looking like the two of them have it all. They have this zest for life. They're young, they're in love, they're excited, and they're sharing this with their friends, their family, and their current at the time and potential future followers online. It looked like this beautiful romance. It's kind of like those families that we'll see on YouTube or on Instagram and you're like, wow, they're everything I want. And then they have that sit down video where they're like, it isn't as it seems we're breaking up and you're like, what the hell? Um, I guess that's life right? From the outside, it really did, guys. It seemed great. And the two of them both had this passion and this drive for van life, especially Gabby. She was really eager to begin this chapter of adventure and van life. But Gabby didn't just want to adventure in this van. She wanted to vlog it and share these adventures with the world. It seemed as though Gabby thought it would be so cool to travel, to ride around in her converted van, to vlog it, to experience it, and to share it with people. And if she could get paid for it, it was just going to be the icing on the cake for her. She wanted to be one of those travel vloggers. And honestly, she was so good at it. We'll get there. But that was really a dream of hers. So when Brian heard about this, he got excited thinking about the places that they could go together on these adventures. And so began the plans. In 2020, Gabby and Brian began working on Gabby's white 2012 Ford Transit van to convert it into their new home on wheels. And their love story, by the way, it moved seemingly fast. But again, it seemed like they were the right fit for one another. On July 2nd of 2020, Gabby actually posted a photo of the two of them on Instagram, captioning it. Here's a picture from our first date because I have so much love for you. Brian asked me to marry him and I said yes. And then she added him and said, you make life feel unreal. Every day is such a dream with you. Sounds pretty damn fantastic. You know, so much love for him, asking her to marry him, her saying yes, he makes life feel unreal every day is a dream. So in July, 22-year-old Gabby Petito is happily engaged, ready to start this life adventure, and seemingly 
happy. So Gabby starts up this YouTube channel called Normatic Static with the plan of heading off on these adventures with her fiance by her side, filming it, sharing it, and hopefully making a career out of it. So Gabby and Brian planned this four month trip where the two of them were going to visit and explore a series of national parks. Now, at first, Gabby's parents were worried for her heading out on this adventure. I think like any caring, concerned parent would be, but they felt as though with Brian by her side, Gabby was again in good hands. She was going to be taken care of by Brian and they felt better knowing that he was there and they just told her to be safe and to not trust everybody that she meets. And I think that that is another component of this case that is so chilling, even as the the months and years go on, is that her parents are here telling her to stay safe and to not trust everybody that she meets. But yet, the real monster here, in the end, was the very person who she not only knew and trusted, but agreed to marry and spend the rest of her life with. And I think statistically, it's proven that you're more likely to be murdered by your own spouse than anybody else, but it's just so sad. With that being said, though, Gabby had said that she would check in as often as possible with her parents, and they felt confident in that. And again, they thought that Brian was going to help keep her safe, so they were just excited for her when all was said and done, and she was ready to head out on the adventure. And Gabby really held up this end of the bargain. Gabby's mom said that she would talk to her at any chance that she could, and when she had good service, she would talk to her or check in in some way, shape, or form almost every day or every other day. And her mom loved hearing about all of her adventures, and she just was so happy for Gabby. Now, not only was Gabby sharing these amazing updates and images and videos of her adventures with her family, but Gabby was also uploading consistently to her Instagram and soon her YouTube channel. And she was sharing these adventures and these photographs. And again, guys, it just looks like the most incredible trip. Like one of those trips that you're watching someone go on on Instagram and you're like, damn, I so wish I was doing this right now it looked like so much fun. And Gabby did have quite a few followers on Instagram at the time, I will say. So through these images and through these updates that Gabby is providing her family with, it seems as though the trip is going well. But on August 12th, there would be a whole new view shared of Gabby and Brian and what their relationship was really looking like behind closed doors. In a call to 911, a witness described seeing a male hitting a female. Hi, uh, I'm calling, I'm right on the corner of Main Street by Moonflower, and we're driving by and I'd like to report a domestic dispute in Florida with a white van, Florida license plate, white land, gentleman, about five, six beard. They just drove off. They're going down Main Street. They made a, uh, a right onto Main Street from Moonflower. Or what were they doing? Cooperative, but um, what'd you say? What were they doing? Uh, we drove by and the gentleman was slapping the girl. He was slapping her? Yes, and then we stopped. They ran up and down the sidewalk. He proceeded to hit her, hopped in the car, and they drove off. Okay, you said it's a white van? In later released heartbreaking police cam footage, you see that the man in question was Brian Laundrie, and the girl he was allegedly seen hitting was, in fact, Gabby. Now, in this video, Gabby is distraught and crying. She is visibly shaken. She is in a state of anxiety. She explains that the two of them were fighting and that she was dealing with some personal matters. And the police then separate the two. And an apologetic Gabby begins trying to tell the officers what has been going on. But Brian is cool as a cucumber. He's cracking jokes with law enforcement. He's calm, collected. He's casual. He seems very 
calculated in my personal opinion. There have been like behavioral analysis is done on Brian's body language. And that's interesting to look into in and of itself. There's a very evident imbalance of power in this relationship. Gabby feels apologetic, scared. Her body language is so telling. And then there's Brian who feels very in control of the situation, calm, collected, laughing. That has never felt right to me. Not from the moment that that footage was released prior to any further discoveries that would take place. What's you guys' names? Gabby. I'm Brian. Gabby, Brian, okay. What's going on? How come you're crying? I'm crying. We've just been fighting this morning. Some personal issues. It was a long day. We were camping yesterday and camping got the stuff, flies and stuff. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I hit the, the bump there. <laughs> I was distracting him from driving. I'm sorry. Can I get you to step out of the vehicle for me, man? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's just some days I, <laughs> I have really bad OCD, and okay. I just I was just cleaning and straightening up the back of the van before, and I was apologizing to him and saying I'm sorry that I'm so mean because sometimes I have OCD and sometimes I just get really frustrated. Not like mean towards him. I just like I guess my vibe is like I really hear me like in a bad mood. I was just saying, I'm sorry if I'm in a bad mood. I've just been really stressed. I had so much work I was doing on my computer this morning. And I'm trying to start a blog. I okay. just have a blog and stuff. So I've been building my website. So I've just been really stressed. And he doesn't really believe that I could do any of it. So that's kind of been like a, I don't know. He's like, in, I don't know. We've just been fighting all morning. And and he wouldn't let me in the car before. And then Why I, wouldn't he let you in the car? Because you told me your OCD? told me I needed to calm down, yeah, <laughs> but I'm perfectly calm, I'm calm all the time, and he really stresses me out, and I just, and this is a rough morning. But we just had a little disagreement there, and this disagreement was just that she was getting a little worked up, and I was saying, no, it's okay, thank you so much. As long as cool, that's good. <laughs> Do I see my, yeah, my, my heart rate up? Whenever the lights flash on, it, it gets your heart rate up. If I see my Trust me, it does me too, and I'm the one that <laughs> it, it yeah. gets me going a little bit. You probably bit can too, say, hey, buddy, whenever somebody walks up. <laughs> so, okay. All right, I'm going to take your break now. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to be with her again. I was just really stressed this morning trying to get a lot of work done, and I was apologizing to him. The, the, I had thrown a bunch of stuff in the back, and all our bags are back there, and I was just apologizing. I was like, I'm sorry that. I get so stressed out because I have OCD and I'm just like organizing stuff and sometimes I just have a mean attitude but I'm not trying to be mean about just straightening things up and stuff so I was just apologizing but I guess I said it in a, like a mean tone and he got really frustrated with me and he locked me out of the car and told me to go take a breather but I didn't want to take a breather because I wanted to get going we're, we're out of water so it kind of made you more upset <laughs> yeah, it we're... didn't help calm you it made you more upset yeah and, so then what happened? And, um, so I, I, our goal was to come here and come refill our water. So what happened after he locked you out? I told you to take a uh, breather. Well, he walked away to go take his own breather. And, but I wanted to sit in the car because there was, all my stuff was in the car. I had to yeah. run my bag. And I, had to, I was working on something at the moment in the car. And he told me to just relax for a second. And I, I didn't want to relax. So I got, got really mad. I mean, I don't need to be mad. Yeah, it happens. Then what happened? Have and, then mad? I, and then I told him to drive and get water because I'm really thirsty. Yeah? Is there something on your cheek here? Looks like, did, did you get did you get hit in the face? Um, kind of looks like something like hitting you in the face. I don't know. And then over on your arm, um, your shoulder, right here. There's, that's new, huh? It's kind of a new mark. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Can I see the other side of your face? So, what happened here and here? Um, I, I'm not sure it was a... First name, Brian. Really I was just trying to get in the back of the car and his backpack was on the back. And it got me. So, the backpack got you? There's two people saying that they saw him punch you. We're just independent witnesses by Moonflower. Well, to be honest, I definitely hit him first. Where'd you hit him? I slapped him. You slapped him first, and then just on his face. He kept telling me to shut up. How many times did you slap Bravo him? Romeo, India. 
couple. And then what? And then his reaction was to, to do what? Grab him. Like he just grabbed you. He hit you though. I mean, I mean, it's okay if you're saying you hit him, and then I, I understand if he hit you. But we want to know the truth if he actually hit you. Because you know. I guess. Yeah, but I hit him first. Where did he hit you? Don't don't worry. Just well, be he honest. He like grabbed my face. Like. I guess. Uh -huh. um, he didn't like hit me in the face. Like he didn't like punch me in the face or anything. Did he slap but, your face or what? Well, like he like grabbed me like with his nail, and I guess that's why it looks. Like, I definitely have a cut right here. It's like a peel of yeah. like, touch and it burns. So when I go to court now. Can I have a I ticket for hitting the curb. Earn something, please, because we're okay. Like we're just. I understand, it? but we don't have we don't have any, like. Listen, if I had any discretion of this, I would separate you guys for the day and just give you warnings to stop hitting each other. <laughs> but I lawfully don't have discretion here. I, I don't have any... Is because somebody said something, like a witness said something? Because there's two witnesses. And then there's what you said and what he said. And guess what? It all matches nicely that, that you were the primary aggressor and that the injuries he has were caused by your aggression towards him. Even if he doesn't feel hurt, even if he doesn't want to press charges, there's nothing any cop can do about it. It's written into the law. I know, but I don't... Normally, we take people to jail, but he's trying to work it so you can just have the van. Tomorrow... I don't, I don't want to be separated. <laughs> you can have anxiety? Yeah, yeah. No, we're a team, please. <laughs> there's not? What is it? No, like, we're a team, please. I'm gonna, he's going to give me so much anxiety. Can we just have, like, a, a driving ticket? Okay, the, the very best thing I can do is call my supervisor... And see if I'm missing something here. <laughs> because if we get, I'll, I'll pay you any driving ticket, a parking ticket, anything. Okay, Gabby, if that'd be Gabby better, try to calm down and I'm going to go call a supervisor. But I don't think that there's much I can do, but let me see if the supervisor can tell me something I'm missing. I want to note at one point during that footage, when Gabby is asked if Brian had hit her, she is very reluctant to give an answer to this. It's very obvious that she was uncomfortable to get him in any sort of trouble. When Gabby does finally admit to him having hit her, she puts a lot of emphasis on the fact that she's to blame, that she hit him first. And while this may be true, it's very difficult and very hard for me to watch. My mother throughout my childhood was in abusive relationships and it's so easy from the outside looking in when you haven't experienced this imbalance of power and this fear and this feeling of being so small and so scared of the consequences of telling somebody what's going on and not wanting to lose this person. And in seeing this in Gabby, it's, it's, it brings back a lot of memories for me because it's so simple to say, why wouldn't she have spoke up? Why wouldn't she have told the deeper truth? If there was more abuse going on, if there was, you know, physical or even verbal or just anything, why wasn't she forthcoming with it? She was separated from him, but it's so much deeper than that. And I've seen it firsthand and it absolutely breaks my heart. And that's where I want to go into and discuss a part of this case that again haunts me to this day and I want to put emphasis on something here we oftentimes criticize things with hindsight hindsight's 2020 right so looking back we can analyze this footage and we can fault the officers and claim that they were too lenient that they were too nice that they didn't interrogate it enough that they put all the blame on Gabby and they fell into Brian's trap I've, I've read it all that people are saying about these poor officers and yes, as I said, hindsight is twenty twenty. Could have, would have, should have. There's a million situations in life where, in hindsight, anybody wishes they could have done things differently. And I'm sure those officers carry that with them. But based off of the information that they were given, there was only so much that they could do, right? And there's a part here that really chills me to my core. Uh, it's when the officer, I'm just referencing my notes here because I really want to properly convey what I'm seeing here. There's one point in this footage where he heads to his car and he sees if there's any way that he can actually return Gabby back to Brian. He's feeling quite sad for her. I'm not sure if it was mentioned, but the energy I get, he's got this like fatherly energy. He's very 
kind. He's very kind to Gabby in this, but he says something within this that chills me to my core. So the reason that he's referring to Gabby as the primary aggressor and Brian as the victim is because of the situation, the way that it was reported. But the officer doesn't feel that Brian's in any form of danger here with Gabby. During this time, he says, because too many times women who are at risk want to go back to their abuser. They just wanted him to stop and they don't want to have to be separated. They don't want him charged. They don't want him to go to jail. And then they end up getting worse and worse treatment. And then they end up getting killed. But then again, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm going to go reread the statute and just see if, if it fits or if there's a way it doesn't fit. And if I can find a way that, because it, it really is, this, the spirit of the law is being lost on this one. It really is. So let me see what I can find, and if nothing else, mm -hmm. then we'll have to separate him whether she likes it or not. All right, thanks. Hey, how, okay, how far do you want to go with this? Like, you know why the domestic assault code is there. It's there to, to protect people, especially, the reason why they don't give us discretion on these things is because too many times women who are at risk want to go back to their abuser, they just wanted him to stop, and they don't want to have to be separated, they don't want him charged, they don't want him to go to jail, and then they end up getting worse and worse uh, treatment, and then they end up getting killed. Mm -hmm. In no way, shape, or form that I can perceive does what happened here, a little slap fight between fiancés who love each other and want to be together, can I perceive that this is going to digress into the situation where he's going to be a battered man? Right. But then again, I don't have a crystal ball. Gabby, this is a very, very important question. How you answer this question is going to determine what happens next. But the only person who can answer this question is you. Okay. Think very hard before you answer the question. Do not quickly answer it. Think very hard. When you slapped him those times, were you attempting to cause him physical pain or physical impairment? Was that what you were attempting to do to him? What were you what were you attempting to do? What was the reason behind the slapping and, and stuff? What was what was it you were attempting to accomplish by slapping? I was trying to get him to stop telling me to come back. Well it doesn't sound to me like she attempted to injure him. It's your call. This is hundred percent your call. I think about this very often. It chills me that he quite literally predicted what could what could happen and what would unfortunately happen. But the two were separated for the night. And, you know, no action was taken from this incident. Nobody followed up with the couple afterwards. In fact, this only surfaced later on. But that would be the first real glimpse where when things started coming out after Gabby's disappearance, we started realizing that there was a lot more to this relationship than we'd realized. And while I didn't get too much into it a moment ago, I do want to note that experts did analyze this footage and they found Brian's body language to be both alarming and manipulative. But again, I am not a body language expert whatsoever. Now this footage that I just shared with you guys is so hard for Gabby's family to watch and understandably so. They said they wanted to jump through the screen to save her, that she was a girl who needed help and who needed support. But after this incident, the couple would continue on their journey together. Again, nothing came from this incident other than a nightly separation and this would only come to light later on. So as far as everybody else knows, still things are great on this trip between Gabby and Brian. So here's a timeline that I want to jump through here. On August 17th, Brian flies home from Florida to get some belongings and to close out their storage unit. On August 19th, the very first video was posted on their YouTube channel titled Van Life, Beginning Our Van Life Journey. On August 21st, Gabby FaceTimed her dad. On August 23rd, Brian returns to join Gabby on the rest of their trip. 
And on August 25th, Gabby last spoke with her mom. Gabby had told her mom that they were heading to Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. And her mom was so excited for her. She recalled, you know, searching up the the place and talking about what they were going to see. She was really, really excited. And then on August 25th, Gabby also posted some photos of herself on Instagram, which would be her last Instagram post. This is where things start to get bizarre. On August 27th, Gabby's mother receives a text message from Gabby, very out of the ordinary, reading, can you help Stan? I just keep getting his voicemails and missed calls. Now I'm sure you're wondering who Stan is. Stan was her grandfather, but Gabby didn't refer to him as Stan. So this was very strange to Gabby's mother. I mean, this would be like me texting my mom, like, can you tell Candace to return my calls when my grandma was still alive? And it's like, Candace or Grams? On August 30th, they would receive another text message from Gabby saying no service in Yosemite. But the last time that they had spoken to her, Gabby was supposed to be on her way to Yellowstone. So this didn't even really add up either. So that was like two strange text messages back to back, the stand text message, and then the no service in a location that she wasn't even supposed to have been in. Following this, everybody just stops hearing from Gabby. There's no more text messages, no more FaceTimes, no more phone calls, and nothing on social media. It gets to a point where Gabby's family is growing increasingly concerned. Here's the thing though, the couple had in fact reached Wyoming. On the evening of August 27th, a couple walked into a little Mexican restaurant and described having seen Brian and Gabby, though the interaction was anything but joyful. The couple described Brian as aggravated, aggressive. They described Gabby as sad, crying, increasingly upset. It said that Brian was argumentative with some of the servers. Gabby really didn't like this. And actually the woman had said to her partner word for word, and I quote here, he's creeping me out and said that it seemed as though Gabby was truly at her breaking point with Brian and whatever had been going on. Now it is believed that this was the last time Gabby Petito was seen alive. So remember, Gabby has been keeping in touch with her family religiously. She's been on top of communicating as best she can. And after not hearing from her daughter for four to five days, Gabby's mother starts growing increasingly worried. But again, trying to keep in mind that they may not have service. Again, there was that message stating that there was no service and that perhaps Gabby wanted to reach out but was unable to and would reach out to her shortly. But as time continued to go on, something just really didn't feel right. They kept checking in on her social media, checking in with one another to hear if anybody had gotten a message and there was no sort of update. So at this point, Gabby's family decided it would make most sense to reach out to Brian's family and see if Brian had heard or if Brian had contacted them and if they had heard anything from Brian. No response. So on September 11th, after 10 days of not hearing from Gabby, Gabby Petito was reported missing. This is where things take a shocking turn. Gabby Petito is reported missing, but to her family's absolute horror, you guys, the detectives inform her that while Gabby is missing, Brian Laundrie is in fact not, nor is Gabby's van, as Brian Laundrie had returned home with Gabby's van without Gabby and that he had been there since September 1st. But not only that, he lawyered up. He lawyered up. This is still so unfathomable to me. Like I try to put myself into the perspective of the families in this situation. I actually even discuss this with my father at length. I can't imagine Tyler and I going on some cross-country adventure in my Jeep. 
and my family not hearing from me, reaching out to his family, not hearing anything, reporting me missing and finding out that he has returned home with my vehicle. I'm not there. And he's lawyered up and isn't speaking to anybody like that will never not baffle me in this case. Sorry. I'm like stumbling over my words, how these families could sit there and not reach out to get, we'll get there. But Gabby's family at this point is just absolutely terrified. And I mean, rightfully so. Now they have way more questions than answers. Brian's fine. Brian's alive. Brian's home has been home. Hasn't reached out. Has Gabby's van. Gabby's missing. He's lawyered up. The parents aren't talking. What the actual, like what? Gabby's family was not sleeping at this point. They're doing absolutely anything and everything that they can to get her face out there, her name out there, her last known locations out there. They are doing the work. And honestly, her face ended up splashed everywhere. Holding on to hope, she will be found safe and sound. Look at every picture that you're going to see on this screen. Watch the video. Let her face burn it into your memory. Like the way she stands, talks, walks, you know, the holds the peace signs up. She's got to let it be on a forum. Burn those images into your memory when you're driving down the road or you're hiking a trail. If you think you see her, call a tip line. The entire world, it felt like, knew that Gabby Petito was missing and wanted to help find Gabby. People were looking for Gabby non stop people online were analyzing her social media posts trying to find cryptic messages things in the photos uh likes comments activity like they were analyzing digging deep on gabby and trying to find where she could be located and honestly everybody the public especially was just disgusted with the lack of help from the laundry family like zip like brian laundry and his parents chris and roberta laundry were not speaking to anyone and they didn't want to talk about anything to do with the investigation brian is a person of interest and not specifically a suspect in the investigation so at this point in time um they weren't required to talk to law enforcement and nor did they try to the police were watching brian though they had set up surveillance outside of the laundry family home and they had set up cameras in the neighboring yards as well to keep close watch and monitor on brian laundry however and this always makes me giggle a little bit but it's so not funny it's just so insane to me how this even happens while the police are monitoring brian laundry and keeping an eye on him again there's so much suspicion surrounding him (laughs) on september 17th they would receive a call from brian's parents except they did not want to talk about gabby or gabby's disappearance no 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 in fact they wanted to now report brian laundry missing how could brian be missing you may wonder. Well, the laundries claimed that on September 13th, Brian had went out for a hike and had never returned. So people are now starting to question how in the hell did Brian escape his home without some sort of police monitoring? And how was he now missing? Well, it seems as though they had mistaken Roberta Laundry, Brian's mom, as Brian, and they had been monitoring her instead of Brian and that's how he slipped through the cracks funny but not funny so at this point there are police law enforcement everything under the sun looking for Brian Laundry in Florida and there are police and and everybody looking absolutely everywhere they can for Gabby in Wyoming and there is just so much talk at this time about this case I remember just Everybody is giving updates and everybody's keeping up on it. And because of this, a shocking clue as to Gabby's whereabouts 
surface. So a couple that also lives inside their van and travels around vlogging their adventures was trying to find a spot for them to camp their van that night. When they found themselves in the Spread Creek camping area near Grand Teton National Park. Now this is when they passed a white van and this wasn't just any white van to this family this stood out to them because it too had florida plates and the couple themselves were from florida as well so they thought it would be cool to introduce themselves or meet these fellow travelers in their van from florida but unfortunately it seemed like it was dark so despite wanting to say hi to whomever was there they ended up assuming that they were either sleeping or perhaps out for a hike or whatever the case was and so they had just continued on their journey but as gabby's case began making headlines it was brought to their attention that they were within the general vicinity of where gabby had last been seen they began imagining that perhaps they had seen gabby's van and they began rummaging through the footage on their gopro to lo and behold discover that it was in fact gabby petito's van that they had drove past that day and captured on camera so the couple calls the fbi and authorities began searching the area and on the 19th of september 300 meters from where her van had been parked they would discover human remains consistent with the description of Gabby Petito. Now, something that I think is both absolutely heartbreaking, but also beautiful is that Gabby's parents were really hopeful the day that they found her body, that she would be able to find peace and truly go to a better place. And what's even more bone chilling is Gabby's mom had noted that she herself had watched 60 minutes and that she was interested in true crime documentaries never imagining that her family would become a part of one that their daughter would be the victim of murder and and it's just it's chilling i think about that quite often when i'm watching videos of this sorts or i'm watching things on tv i'm like you just never think that it would be you so to hear gabby's mom say that was notable for me now brian is still missing at this point in the case but the autopsy results would reveal that the remains found were in fact gabby petito that she had in fact been murdered and the cause of death was strangulation Okay, now here's where things just get insane and it wouldn't be my channel if I didn't incorporate or include this part of this case, but the day that the family found the footage of Gabby Petito's van, that traveling family, it was their son, Ethan's birthday, okay? You guys, Ethan had passed away in 2011 in a car accident on their way to Disney for his seventh birthday. There are so many people who believe that Ethan's spirit helped to get this footage and to five goosebumps and to find Gabby's body. His mom actually said that she found the footage on what would have been Ethan's 17th birthday. And she believes that he had a hand in bringing Gabby home, which is incredible. But with that being said, let's go back to Brian, because again, at this point in time, yes, we have discovered Gabby has been murdered, cause of death, of strangulation. And Brian is now missing. So according to Brian's parents, he had went for a hike in a wildlife reserve in Florida that he was familiar with. That is important to keep in mind. He had both hiked and camped there before, according to those close to him. But this was a very tough spot to search as there was 24,000 acres of land, guys. 24,000 acres of land to cover, but not just like land. It was very, very difficult terrain to navigate as well. At this point, Brian is still labeled as a missing person, but law enforcement is doing absolutely everything that they can to find Brian. This was a massive search and people thought up until this point too, it's even more suspicious. Why are Brian's parents still not talking? I could bring that up throughout all of this, repeating myself continuously, but it's just astonishing. They did not speak at all, not even when their own son was missing. There was little blips here and there. Now, the only family member who would actually speak up is Brian's sister, 
Cassie. And she herself was kept completely in the dark. She said that her parents and her brother hadn't said a word to her and that she was as heartbroken learning about all of this as everybody else, that she was learning in real time with the rest of the world what the hell was going on. I haven't been able to speak to my brother. I have been honest. What happened? Like, I don't just, know just, what happened. Yeah. The I, thing about it is we know Gabby's family. Gabby is... We do too. What do you want us to do? We cooperate with the police. We're not supposed to talk to anybody, and you're making my children cry. We're, we're, was Brian with you on September 1st? Did he come to this yes, house? He yes, he came to this house with my parents in their Mustang, not the van. I did not know that he took that van back. I found out the next day with everybody else. We are just as upset, frustrated, and heartbroken as everybody else. And I am losing my parents and my brother and my ch children's aunt and my future sister-in-law on top of this. And you're not helping Why your parents? Why, why your parents? You're talking about Christmas. they're not talking to us either. Why aren't we, they talking to you guys? If I knew, <laughs> I would say, I don't know. Do you think they're involved, your parents? I don't know. You don't know? We know. You're not involved? We have literally been finding everything out with the news with like everybody else. It was actually quite sad to see the harassment outside of her home, knowing that she had no answers to give anybody. But on September 22nd, a warrant was in fact issued for Brian's arrest, but this was issued for bank fraud as Brian had spent more than a thousand dollars on Gabby's bank card, but they were finally able to nail him for something, right? And on the 20th of October, Brian's father would join in the search for Brian two months after Gabby Petito had been murdered. And 37 days after Brian was reported missing, investigators found partial human remains, a backpack, and a notebook, amongst other things, that belonged to Brian that had been found in an area previously submerged underwater. And Brian was confirmed dead. On Tuesday, November 23rd, it was in fact ruled a suicide with a single gunshot wound to the head. So now we know at this given point in time, Gabby has been murdered, Brian disappeared, and Brian had taken his own life. But to so many, it felt as though the answers that everyone had been looking for, especially after Gabby's remains had been found, had died with Brian. Everyone felt like the only person who knew the truth, the only remaining living person who knew the truth of what happened that night that Gabby was murdered has now died. So where did this leave us? Well, really, it left us and investigators hoping that there would be something within that notebook that was able to explain what the hell happened between this seemingly loving and perfect couple. So they had taken the personal notebook, hoping to retrieve some information within that. And crucial to their investigation would be Brian's digital communications, his text messages, his emails, his Google searches, his browsing history in general, anything and everything that they could find digitally, like a trail prior to everything that had happened with Brian was crucial to investigators. Now, Brian's parents had surrendered their firearms to law enforcement the same day that they reported their son missing when they realized that their handgun wasn't in the case or a handgun. Now, this wasn't breaking news at the time. This was released afterwards because the gun being publicly shared was believed to potentially cause chaos amongst the public. It actually says here by their attorney, imagine with the frenzied atmosphere at the time, if the public thought that Brian had a gun, I mean, touche, but he did. So nobody had known about that. And at this point in time as well, the Petito family is repeatedly advised not to speak out, to let the FBI continue their investigation, to allow the United States Attorney's Office to make a determination as to whether or not any additional individuals would be charged and to essentially lay low to which they did. But let's talk about Gabby's family for a minute here. The concept that Brian had killed their daughter was absolutely terrifying to them. Again, guys, this was somebody that they trusted with their daughter that they believed would be in better hands on her adventure because he was there and yet 
this was the outcome, but I need to place emphasis on Gabby's family and the grace they upheld throughout the investigation and the aftermath and through the tragedy of losing Gabby. It's, it's truly remarkable and heartbreaking. And while this tragedy should have absolutely never happened, what they have chose to bring forth with the loss of Gabby has been nothing shy of incredible and it's going to help a lot of people. Her family would start the Gabby Petito Foundation in order to draw attention to other missing persons cases or domestic violence issues. They don't want to see anybody else end up like Gabby did and they believe that every family deserves the coverage that Gabby got, which was incredible to see them acknowledge because, again, there are so many cases that are swept under the rug that don't gain the coverage and don't have the resources and the public support. And it was so incredible to see the Petitos encouraging the public to provide the support for other families and wanting to use gabby's foundation to help them i thought that was really really incredible but on january 21st of 2022 things would take a shocking shocking leap the fbi would announce that brian laundry had in fact written a confession in his notebook found near his remains and that he had in fact confessed to killing gabby and went on to say that by using Gabby's credit card and sending messages from her phone, he was then trying to cover up what he had done. It was also said that at this time, the investigation did not identify any other individuals other than Brian directly involved in the tragic death of Gabby Petito, which made sense. But where it enraged people was the fact that the laundries weren't being held accountable for not being forthcoming with this information. There are so many people that believe there is no world in which Brian returns home without his girlfriend, but with his girlfriend's van, goes home to his parents' residency and doesn't begin to tell them what happened. Just tells them don't talk and they never talk. They never reach out. They don't ask their own questions. It's, it's, it's concerning to many. But let's get into this confession because I feel like this is, is so important to dig into. It, it just... Oof. All right. Gabby, I wish I was right at your side. I wish I could be talking to you right now. I'd be going through every memory we made, getting even more excited for the future. But we lost our future. I can't live without you. I've lost every day we could have spent together. Every holiday. Never go hiking with TJ. I loved you more than anything. I can't bear to look at our photos, to recall great times, because it is why I cannot go on. When I close my eyes, I will think of laughing on the roof of the van, falling asleep to the sunlight at the crystal geyser. I will always love you. If you were reading Gab's journal, looking at photos from our life together, flipping through old cards, you wouldn't want to live a day without her. Knowing that every day you'll wake up without her, you wouldn't want to wake up. I'm sorry to everyone this will affect. Gabby was the love of my life, but I know adored by many. I'm so very sorry to her family because I love them. I'd consider her younger siblings my best of friends. I am sorry to my family. This is a shock to them as well, a terrible grief. They loved as much, if not more than me. A new daughter to my mother, an aunt to my nephews. Please don't make this harder for them, this unexpected tragedy. Rushing back to our car, trying to cross the streams, before it got too dark to see, too cold. I hear a splash and a scream. I could barely see. I couldn't find her for a moment, shouted her name. I found her breathing heavily, gasping. She was freezing cold. The temperature had dropped to freezing, and she was soaking wet. I carried her as far as I could from the stream toward the car, stumbling, exhausted in shock, when I knew I couldn't safely carry her. I started a fire and spooned her close to the heat. She was so thin and had already been freezing too long. 
I couldn't at the time realize that I should have started a fire first, but I wanted her out of the cold and back to the car. From where I started the fire, I had no idea how far the car might be, only that it was across the creek. When I pulled Gabby out of the water, she couldn't tell me what hurt. She had a small bump on her forehead that got larger. Her feet hurt. Her wrist hurt. But she was freezing, shaking violently. While carrying her, she continually made sounds of pain. Laying next to her, she said little between violent shakes, gasping in pain, begging for her pain to end. She would fall asleep, and I would shake her awake, fearing she shouldn't close her eyes if she had a concussion. She would wake in pain and start her whole painful cycle again, furious that I was the one waking her. She wouldn't let me try to cross the creek, thought like me that the fire would go out in her sleep and she would freeze. I don't know the extent of Gabby's injuries, only that she was in extreme pain. I ended her life. I thought it was merciful, that it was what she wanted, but I see now all the mistakes I made. I panicked. I was in shock, but from the moment I decided, took away her pain, I knew I couldn't go on without her. I rushed home to spend any time I had left with my family. I wanted to drive north and let James or TJ kill me, but I wouldn't want them to spend time in jail over my mistake, even though I'm sure they would have liked to. I am ending my life, not because of fear of punishment, but because I can't stand to live another day without her. I've lost our whole future together, every moment we could have shared. I'm sorry for everyone's loss. Please do not make life harder for my family. They lost a son and a daughter, the most wonderful girl in the world. Gabby, I'm sorry. I have killed myself by this creek in the hopes that animals may tear me apart, that it may make some of her family happy. Please pick up all of my things. Gabby hated people who litter. This confession rightfully shocked the world. How in the hell could that be what happened? Now, this is my personal opinion. I do not believe this is how things went down. I can't comprehend a world where somebody's fiance who loves them so much would believe that putting them out of their misery to this degree was a better option than at least trying to get them to a hospital or trying to get them help. And I certainly can't believe that leaving her body there and not telling her family where she was or what had happened. I do want to note though, that things don't look great for the laundry family, specifically when a letter written by Brian's mother that says burn after reading was released and added an incredible amount of fuel. I just want you to remember, I will always love you. And I know you will always love me. You are my boy. Nothing can make me stop loving you. Nothing will or could ever divide us, no matter what we do or where we go or what we say. We will always love each other. If you're in jail, I will bake a cake with a file in it. If you need to dispose of a body, I will show up with a shovel and garbage bags. If you fly to the moon, I will be watching the skies for your re-entry. If you say you hate my guts, I'll get new guts. Remember that love is a verb, not a noun. It's not a thing. It's not words. It is actions. Watch people's actions to know if they love you, not their words. Therefore, I am certain that neither death nor life nor angels, nor the ruling spirits, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers from above, no powers from below, nothing in the entire create world can separate our love. Neither hostile powers, nor messengers of heaven, nor monarchs of earth, nothing has the power to separate us. Romans 8, 38, extended version. Nothing can separate us, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not threats, not even sin, not the thinkable or unthinkable can get between us, not time, not miles and miles and miles. The letter was encased in an envelope titled Brian Christopher Laundry, Burn After Reading.
Norberta Laundry claims that this letter was written prior to the couple leaving on their trip and had absolutely nothing to do with Gabby. However, Gabby Petito's parents did file a civil lawsuit against Brian's parents for intentional infliction of emotional distress. It claimed that his parents were aware that he had murdered Gabby and did nothing other than release a statement through their attorney. Gabby Petito's family would reach a settlement with the Laundry family reluctantly. The terms of the settlement were not disclosed publicly, but after a long day of mediation, the case will no longer require a civil trial. Gabby's family wanted Gabby's story to be so much more than her tragic death, her life taken too soon. Gabby was this creative, loving, full of life, beautiful person. And they really want her story to be heard and make a difference in somebody's life. They want her legacy to be how Gabby changed the world, not what had happened to Gabby. And where this case has light shining from within it, from a very, very dark situation, is that so many women have came forward stating that Gabby is the reason that they chose to leave their abusive partners. That Gabby is the reason they found help and they got out. And while that doesn't bring Gabby back, it brings some sort of light to her senseless murder. Gabby's family has also said in a couple of interviews how they've been receiving spiritual signs from Gabby that she's on the other side and that she's okay and she's always with them. And Gabby's YouTube video guys has millions of views. I believe it's at like 7 million views, which is something that she would have loved to have seen in her lifetime. And I just think that's so incredible. Her video is so good. I would have loved to have seen where that would have taken her. She was so talented for just her first videos. So it's just a really, really heartbreaking case overall, honestly. Gabby Petito was a beautiful girl who had so much life left to live. And whether or not what we learned is the truth as to what happened, we'll never truly know. I mean, everybody wants the answers as to what really happened, what pushed it to this point. But sometimes those are answers that none of us could ever even comprehend, even if we got them. What do you guys think of this case in particular? I would really, really like to hear in the comment section down below. And with that being said, I hope that you guys enjoyed this deep dive into this case. If there are any other cases that you would like to see me cover, please, please, please let me know. I am definitely open to some requests. And that is it for today's video. If you guys are new to my channel or you are just not yet subscribed, but you enjoy my content, I would love if you would join the family and click that subscribe button. Please give this video a big thumbs up and a comment if you'd like. It would mean the world to me. It really, really helps with the algorithm and I have not been uploading, so I could use all the help I could get. And yeah, remember my loves to do all things with kindness. And until my next video, I love you. Bye guys.